Okay, the final speaker today is Larry Golder. Uh, Larry is the Shuzo Nishihara Professor in Environmental and Resource Economics at Stanford University and the Director of the Stanford Center for Environmental and Energy Policy Analysis. The title of his talk is Using Carbon Pricing to Promote Carbon Sequestration. Larry? When people talk about carbon pricing, they're often focusing on the ability of the price to discourage combustion of fossil fuels and thus discourage emissions. But of course, as this workshop has indicated, and what I want to talk about more is how carbon pricing can stimulate the use of natural systems to sequester carbon. So Gretchen, you uh, scooped me. I guess uh, Rob Jackson also scooped me. We've seen this slide before, but it really emphasizes that we need both sequestration and emissions mitigation. Why? Because uh, if you use both, the total cost of achieving any particular ultimate target, whether it's preventing temperature from exceeding a certain level, or cumulative emissions from being reduced to a certain amount, or preventing the concentrations in the atmosphere from exceeding a certain amount, that target will be reached less with at less cost if you combine both approaches because otherwise you'd have to push further on more expensive options within one of those two, two approaches, fossil fuel mitigation or uh, natural climate system mitigation. And by the way, um, the part that's called natural NCS mitigation, I would inc I'm including in it both um, uh, land surface sinks uh, through changes in agriculture and, and forestry practices, as well as subsurface sequestration say geological sequestration, uh, for example, storage in underground aquifers. Now we can quibble about whether uh, we should call it natural. Um, clearly subsurface sequestration doesn't make as much direct use of biologic, biology and also involves a lot of risks, perhaps uh, more risk than uh, in surface uh, sinks, but um, it's at least worth considering the possible contribution there. And I want to emphasize the uncertainties are great. You can be misled uh, by this diagram here, which suggests that, say, 10% of the mitigation is going to come through NCS. We don't know. Rob Jackson mentioned some work that suggests it's somewhere between 5 and 25%. But we just really don't know because we don't know what the relative costs are. And this suggests something beyond carbon pricing, beyond emissions pricing, is going to be useful as a policy matter and that is promotion of research and development. I'm not gonna have time to talk about that, but I wanna emphasize that that's an important complement to carbon pricing. What will I talk about? Well, essentially, I'd like to talk about uh, three things. One is I'd like to talk about links between carbon pricing and carbon sequestration. Second, as a policy question, we're going to use carbon prices, what prices would be appropriate? How high a price? There's a lot of uncertainty there. And third, I'd like to venture into sort of the political and ethical domain a bit and think about how we might try to design policies that attend to questions of fairness and ethics on the one, and also political feasibility. So here are some ways that, here's some instruments that can be used to encourage carbon capture. One is what I call independent payments. That means they're not tied to an existing carbon tax or carbon price, for example, in the form of cap and trade. And um, Gretchen's done a lot of work on this where in Costa Rica, some of the uh, payments were actually tied to uh, fuel taxes. But then some of the payments actually come out of general tre treasury. So that can be independent. And that's very important. But also we can have carbon pricing that's connected with existing policies. So for example, under a carbon tax, a carbon tax also provides an implicit subsidy to carbon sequestration. For example, electric power plants who would otherwise have to under cap and trade uh, pay for additional emissions allowances, they can get credits for emissions reductions to the extent that they, instead of having the emissions go into the atmosphere, they sequester, they engage, or they contract with another firm to sequester the, the carbon in underground aquifers. Um, also, uh, that could be in the case where a power plant uh, faces a carbon tax as well as cap and trade. 
And similarly, offsets under cap and trade are a way of uh, effectively pricing carbon. Because if you make use of the offset, you don't have to buy as many emissions allowances. This is an example of what's actually in place now in California under what was AB 32 and is now moving toward SB 32 as we move toward 2030. What on the left side you see is the emissions reductions occurring from various uh, sources, including cap and trade in sort of the bottom portion of the left-hand pie chart. So, but a big portion of this, 18% of the emissions reductions are coming outside of the cap. That's the light gray. Uh, that's uh, reductions outside of the cap. And on the right, it shows what that consists of. And, and a big portion of that is so-called sustainable forest. Those are forest offsets for forest projects that sequester carbon. So 6%, at least as of 2020, of the overall reductions are coming in the form of offsets. Now, I want to mention that you don't need Public policy is important, but some incentives for, emission, for, for sequestration exist even in the absence of a specific carbon price. Well, the example I would use is oil companies that ordinarily when they extract oil, they would vent some of the natural gas that comes out of the well at the same time, which is basically venting pure methane. But to the extent that in place there are, and there are in the US, restrictions on methane uh, emissions, they can avoid the costs, avoid overlapping with those regulations by instead of venting, sequestering some of the uh, natural gas, putting it into the ground. It actually lowers their costs because it helps them comply with existing methane regulations. Um, but then also, of course, there are publicly provided incentives. Here are channels through which a carbon price yields carbon capture. Here's the carbon price. I'm going to talk about two main channels. One is, as mentioned, there's an implicit subsidy to geological sequestration because an entity that otherwise would be facing a carbon tax can take can credit or deduct from the tax the carbon that actually doesn't make it into the atmosphere. So that's an incentive for more carbon storage geologically. There's another important channel as well, which is with a carbon price, offsets become more valuable because you avoid paying the carbon tax and the higher the carbon tax, the better it is to have an offset. And so with a carbon price, it increases the demand for offsets and it means there's more carbon sinks, for example, on land. So a policy question is, well, first question we wanna know, and there's a lot of uncertainty about it, is how much sequestration would various carbon prices bring about? And I have to say, the bottom line here is that there's tremendous uncertainty but here's um, some work that was done actually a decade ago, but uh, it's as, as good as some of the more recent stuff in many ways. It suggests that at different carbon prices, different amounts of reduction that would occur as a result, uh, that's the, the, the cumulative amount of carbon storage. And so that's not annual, it's cumulative. And one thing to note from this is that a grid, there's a lot of potential at current costs uh, to have a significant amount of reduction coming through agriculture. Here are our slides that show uh, annual effects rather than cumulative effects. And this is showing within agriculture how much would come from cropland, pasture, and rangeland. And notice that the, um, uh, a lot depends on the dollars per metric tons. The vertical axis is the carbon price. If you have, um, for example, a uh, hundred dollar per ton carbon price, you can get somewhere between 75 and 150 million tons of carbon per year reduced as uh, through these three channels. This slide provides a little more detail on the results from the previous slide. And um, it shows, and I wanna focus particularly on the middle panel, the carbon sequestration, whether, and this is all by the way, in the US in agriculture, uh, it's per year through crops, pasture land and range land. Now you might ask, and I do ask, how does this compare with what you might say we need? Well, that depends on what you think is the target. 
but a piece by Keith Smith and others in Nature Climate Change two years ago says that achieving net zero global emissions would require global sequestration of 3 billion tons a year. Well, this suggests, this table on the left suggests that if there's a $100 per ton carbon tax, we would get approximately one tenth um, per year of what is needed. And that you can take as somewhat encouraging, but that also is big barriers to getting that $100 per ton carbon tax. That raises then the question, here I'm gonna throw some economics at you. How high should the carbon price be? And um, you can look at it two ways. And here at Stanford, we often debate this question. One is economists tend to favor basing the carbon price on the time path of the so-called social cost of carbon. That's the externality that's from here to eternity what one extra ton today of CO2 applies in terms of damages, and thus it's the benefit from reducing by one ton today the additional ton into the atmosphere, whether it's through sequestration or it's through cutting it from the smokestack. Now here, by the way, Gretchen did tee me up very well because we would, in principle, not only want to think about uh, the carbon-related benefits, but also co-benefits in terms of uh, if, we, if we use the money to uh, re reduce um, for or afforestation, there'll be reduced erosion, enhanced biodiversity, uh, more ecosystem services, pollination services. So there are a lot of outside of the usual market co-benefits that come here. And this is very much consistent with what Gretchen indicated in her previous slide that we're really trying to take a broader look at these benefits and costs, look at a broader return on investment. And I like the fact that Gretchen mentioned that she's doing some work with others to extend, go beyond GDP in trying to assess how big a carbon price should be. It's not just gonna be the effect on GDP through market mechanisms, both by, um, partly by avoiding climate change. Um, so that's one approach. But another approach, many, um, many researchers say, we just don't know what the social cost of carbon is going to be. What we do want to do instead is set a target, whether it's effect preventing emissions, uh, temperature increase beyond a certain level, or preventing um, atmospheric accumulation of concentration of greenhouse gas from exceeding a certain amount. Let's set the target, and then let's continually adjust the, the price so as to meet that target. So that's the alternative approach. We could spend days debating both sides of this. Either way, there's a crucial need for a price. And what we're quibbling about is price here, which is uh, which should we set the price first or set the quantity target first and then adjust the price to that. So uh, uh, we could talk about that more during the Q&A if, if we need to. But let's suppose for a moment, bear with me, we did take the first approach. We want to know what the price should be. The um, economists say, well, let's figure out the social cost of carbon under the Obama administration. Just, I'm gonna be brief. There's a lot of uncertainty. And the Obama administration back uh, has put together an interagency task force with 12 government agencies involved. And their central estimate using a 3% discount rate then was $42 a ton, now, it's about $50 a ton, but again, wide uncertainty bands. And these estimates do not include what Gretchen mentioned, the co-benefits. You might feel you want the carbon price to be even higher than that central estimate if you wanna take into account these co-benefits. Um, by the way, the Obama administration's estimate today is about $50 a ton. The Trump administration has argued that it should be $3 a ton. And one of the arguments they make is that when we think about the benefits from the US reducing its emissions of CO2, we should just take into account the avoided climate damage that implies to the US and not account for the avoided climate damage that employs to other, applies to other countries. That's a debatable proposition. That's not the only reason, by the way, it goes down to $3 a ton. It also has to do with issues of discount rates. But um, 
just want to estimate there is difference of opinion as to what that social cost of carbon should be. Okay, so I want to now move sort of more into the policy, the question of policy design, assuming we want a carbon tax as a way of providing incentives for both sequestration and for emissions reductions at the smokestack. You know, it's nice to talk about policy solutions, but if you can't get it passed, you're not going to get anywhere. And if it's unfair, you may not want to do it. So some of my own work, and I'm plugging my own work here, focuses on this, and I thought it'd be relevant to today's talk. So I'm going to mention it. it all, a lot of this is discussed in detail in a book that my co-author Mark Hafstead from Resources for the Future put out uh, two years ago. And I'm going to focus on one of the elements that focused on the book is a revenue neutral carbon tax. And uh, the first question of the two, I'm going to talk about fairness and talk about political feasibility. In terms of the fairness question, can a carbon tax be fair? Well, if you think about it, well, first of all, let me qu quickly advance. Here's the carbon tax time profile I'm going to, time profile I'm going to consider, rising at about 4% per year, starting at about $20 a ton, which is well below the social cost of carbon estimate by Obama's administration, and then rising at 4% per year over time. And that occasions about a 45% reduction in emissions um, over the next uh, 30 years or so. How do you make it fair? Well, one of the problems that, that sort of gives us pause when we want to introduce carbon tax is it could disproportionately affect low-income households for whom Carbon intensive goods and services are a larger share of their overall budget. They spend a disproportionate amount on home heating and transportation, uh, electricity. What do you do about that? Well, briefly, if you take a look at the whole picture, including recycling of the revenues, if you judiciously recycle the revenue, you can avoid what would otherwise be a regressive impact. To see that in the red bars here, this is the effect of the carbon tax across five income quintiles if there's no recycling or if the revenue is essentially put back in a proportional manner. And that's regressive, as we expect. The lowest income quintiles hurt the most. These are welfare impacts. Um, on the other hand, the recycling impact itself can be pre progressive, depending on how you recycle. In this particular example, it's all coming in the way that my colleague or Stanford's George Schultz would recommend, give a rebate check of equal amount to every household, which is worth more to a low income household than a higher income household. And those blue um, bars indicate the progressive effect of recycling. Put the two together, the overall impact is slightly progressive. My main point is if you wanna to try to push things forward, concerned about fairness, recycling can go a, lot, a long way. Another question is political feasibility. Can you bring vulnerable industries on board who otherwise would, would, would um, exert an effective veto? But I think you, you can. And um, it, um, again, is a matter of recycling. If you just return the revenue through cuts in individual income taxes, certain industries, particularly the carbon intensive ones, the one shown with arrows here, What's shown here is the present is the percentage change in profits over the next 35 years, be whopping profits impacts, negative impacts on these industries as you make their product more expensive um, and you you reduce demand for their products, et cetera, and you they face the tax. In brief, if you instead use some, and not all, but some of the revenue to pay for um, tax credits. Uh, to, that would offset their corporate income taxes, you can, as those zeros indicate, eliminate what would otherwise be an adverse profit impact to the 10 most vulnerable industries, still having some revenue left over to cut income taxes. So you can do that. It does come at a certain expense in terms of um, the overall cost, but you can do it. So I think that that's at least attractive in terms of fe political feasibility. All right, oops. A couple of political observations, my second last slide. There is action on the Hill, and not just by Democrats. In the last 13, 15 months, there have been eight carbon tax bills proposed by the US Congress to introduce a carbon tax, a form of carbon pricing, 
Uh, two of them are sponsored by Republicans. I uh, can take with that some hope that there's some real interest there. If Trump is reelected, well, you know, it's really hard to make predictions here, but it could be very much the case that uh, there's going to be much less emphasis on a carbon tax. But Trump has already indicated uh, support for the Trillion Trees Initiative, which is uh, to support afforestation. May not be too surprising because in this case, the business community is, is given the carrot rather than the stick. If Biden's elected, hard to say, but much greater likelihood of efforts to spur not only sequestration, but also emissions reductions, perhaps through carbon pricing. Final point, the Biden-Sanders Unity Task Force, which came out with a thousand page report approximately a few weeks ago, has a whole no large number of climate policy recommendations. It does mention carbon pricing, but to the dismay of, of many economists, it focuses a lot more on conventional technology standards. So final slide, my, just to sum up th with three points. One, carbon sequestration is crucial, crucial, critical to bringing the overall cost down. Uh, I should have mentioned that carbon pricing is a good way of allocating effort because it will basically eke out the approaches that are the lowest cost and enable uh, the overall reductions to be achieved at the lowest cost. Pricing carbon is very cost effective for engaging carbon sequestration. And finally, there are a lot of challenges in terms of fairness and political feasibility, but I'm arguing that judicious recycling of the revenues can at least help overcome both the ethical and, and the political feasibility questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Larry. A lot of food for thought there, and I see the questions coming in, so I'm going to hand it over to Jenny. Hi. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Larry, for a very interesting presentation. We have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, we'll start with Laurie Weyburn. Laurie, would you like to unmute yourself when you're able and ask your question? Thank you very much. Can, um, Larry, I appreciate your presentation. Uh, one of the elements there that you had was you implied that the only way to engage NCS solutions was through offsets. And I'd like to ask whether or not um, you see a feasible way to really engage the land sector as a whole, one way of which, of course, would be to treat it the way we have done transportation uh, and energy efficiencies, which is by providing income from a carbon, effectively a carbon tax and cap and trade to transform the management of those sectors. So a, a twofold question. One is your thoughts on that. And the second is what about allocating tax credits into the land sector, which people don't really believe can be pulled under a cap, but providing tax credits for changes in behavior and management to more conservation-based, regenerative forest and agricultural management? These are great questions. Let me start with the, the second one. Tax credits are certainly an option. On a cost effectiveness basis, if your sole concern, if, is, uh, is, is reducing the increase in atmospheric concentrations, in that case, I believe that offsets is, is the best because offsets effectively are providing a subsidy equal to the, the carbon tax price or the price of emissions allowances under cap and trade. But, for political reasons or for reasons of administrative ease, et cetera, tax credits may indeed be the way to go. I think the first part of your question also suggests that there are, are issues that are broader than carbon. They're, um, that, um, in fact, this alludes to what Je uh, Gretchen said in her talk. And to the extent that we want to broaden the reach, and we're concerned about that, then I think direct payments to agriculture to provide for a range of options besides uh, simply sequestration does make sense. So a lot depends on how much weight you're giving to other issues besides um, the climate issue per se. Thank you. Um, we'll ask George Wayne. Um, would you like to ask a question? Unmute yourself when you're able to. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so, and with regards to, and this has been modeled. I just wanted your view, like on rice or dice modeling. Um, but when it comes to a, like a global price. Uh, regards mecha price mechanism, just your view on that, and to the extent, you know, 
uh, in this battle on carbon. It's really a global effort and this cooperation versus non-cooperation, you know, you know, that seems like a much greater, bigger factor than any uh, really price on carbon. I just wondered if we extent you modeled that or to, to understand the sensitivity with regards to what's the bigger lever. Great question. First of all, the ideal solution, the least cost solution is to have a uniform price globally. That way we would eke out the lowest cost reductions everywhere, no matter where they are. However, in connection to the issue of political feasibility and fairness, a global carbon price is going to put unacceptable burdens on low income countries who don't have the resources for that. Is there a way to cut through the dilemma? In principle, there is. In fact, the World Bank is already attending to this to some extent. That would be to introduce a uniform price globally, but then to take the revenue and redistribute it in accord with the economic burdens. So a lot of the revenue, in fact, the preponderance of the revenue could, be re could go back in the form of transfers to especially low income countries. You know, that's been talked about for quite a, a lot of time. It hasn't yet enabled us to come up with a global carbon price, but it at least uh, suggests there's a way of, of dealing with it. And perhaps your, your question gives me an excuse to reinforce a point I think I made too briefly, which is the advantage of having a uniform and broad price is that it helps assure that the allocation of effort towards sinks and sources is done in the least cost matter. Because a facility facing a price of $50 is only gonna undertake the effort if, if it costs at the margin less than $50 to do it. So higher cost options won't be undertaken. And similarly, lower cost options will be. So it really helps allocate the efforts in the most cost effective way.